Okay, I'm going to go ahead and play. I'm just going to play some Coco cartoons and we'll, uh, we'll see what people think. Is this part of your Coco channel? It's part of the uh, Jane's channel, the Fleischer. Oh, she's, yeah, she has her own Fleischer channel, doesn't she? Yeah. Yeah, I think I know which one this is already just by looking at that title. Yeah, which is, it's not actually called Heavenly Days. It's called, I can't remember the title of it right now. Coco's, um, yeah, I can't, I can't think of the title of it. Yeah, the sound is still pretty choppy on this, but the, the picture isn't too bad. Yeah, this looks a lot, an awful lot like my print of this. Coco's Paradise. That was it, wasn't it? Yeah, Coco's Paradise. Yeah, there's a 35 out there. We reached out to an archive. They have it, but they're saying that it's fragile, so we're waiting to see if we can get it scanned. So this is a little less fragile than their their 35. It's pretty nice photographic quality, too. The shots of Max look pretty good. Now, I think some of this is Doc Crandall's uh, animation of Coco and, and Fitz here. Hey, I can hear my echo. <laughs> Music by Winston Sharples, I think. The, these are these all come from the Rainbow Parades. I like I love that rendering uh, when they when they turn into angels, so this is Coco entering and Fitz entering paradise. We're hearing a little bit of the soundtrack to a Paradville Old Folks in the background as we listen to this. <laughs> Halos. Frame rate looks pretty good on this one, uh, Mauricio. Is this, is, this is coming from the YouTube source, correct? So, so the frame rate is much better. Yeah, I'm not recording to the same hard drive, so I think that's why it's it's running much smoother. Yeah. But this looks pretty good. I like the way the the, the Fleischers work this around to be kind of like a surprise ending. They, they hint at it at the beginning, and then it, it, it is finally revealed at the, at the tail end of the cartoon. Yeah, I'm not sure who's, who did the animation here. Not nearly as accomplished as, as Dick's animation. He was so good at drawing, inking, getting action. Wonderful exaggerated poses. Guy, he just had everything. And you couldn't ask for a, a better person than he was, such a hospitable guy. And his wife, Polly, was so fantastic. I mean, she just 
put up with all of us nerds that came over to bother Dick, Dick Humor. And she treated us all like, you know, we were something. So that was a terrific experience to visit him. That's a good little run cycle. I like I like that. Yeah, I like that stuff where uh, Coco turns around because he, he looks a little bit dimensional there. Yeah, I think here they're still mostly working with ink on paper. They they really hadn't converted to cells yet. The Toddle Tales soundtracks in the background. <laughs> I think a little, I think it was the one about the duck. Along came a duck or something like that. Things are turned into a spring. The halos become springs and he pops up to the upper level. Uh, here we are. Now we're, we're working towards that surprise ending I spoke of. That's kind of nice smooth stuff on all the ducks going through the, uh, the line there. That's a pretty big clue right there. <laughs> I, I love that big face in the background. It almost looks like a like a sphinx or something the golden gallery there's a that's a cheap shot <laughs> ah and then it's not quite so cheap because we're going from uh the cartoon backgrounds back to the uh back to the live action makes you wonder if somebody at the Fleischer studio actually i love the face on those pipes the the, the circular uh face wonder if somebody at, at Fleischer studio actually had to build this target for them to shoot at who knows or maybe they went to coney island you know and shot some location material it's hard to tell yeah i love that where they go back into the ink well as oh max quit shooting <laughs> he's trying to kill off his own creations yeah, now these film video prints were nice. These were later acquired by a Sturt Productions, and they just took the film video title off and put their own on there. Oh, there's Sturt Productions. Now this one is terrific because, um, again, Dick Humor did most of the action in this one. And there's some uh, actions he used that uh, he later used in his uh, Scrappy series where the baby uh, punches uh, Coco in the head. <laughs> I don't know who's quite doing this stuff or not, but yeah, there, there's, yeah, here's Coco and the little baby. I don't think that's Dick's stuff right there, but it's coming up. Too bad they cut out the dialogue titles on these. You can kind of tell by the way the action jumps that the, the dialogue titles are missing. I guess when they, when they issued these to TV, they thought, well, children can't read. What are we going to do about this? Oh, I just cut out all those dialogue titles. Who needs them? See, there, there's, there, there was another dialogue title that just went by. Okay, this is Dick's animation right here. See how the kid kind of resembles... <laughs> I love that subway. The, the kid somewhat resembles Scrappy. Yeah, you can tell by the expressions and everything. Say pow, pow, pow. Yeah, that that that, ha that looks like 
Scrappy beating up his baby brother, uh, Oopy, <laughs> later on in the Scrappy pictures. Yeah, D Dick's drawing of and his action that he figured out. Like, look at that beautiful inking. Wow. All the variety of line there. It's a thrill just to look at it. It's so, so beautifully done. All the, on the, all the inked on paper, too. Look at the texture in that diaper. Wow. <laughs> it might be tight over his head. Here's another thing Dick liked to do. He liked to reuse his stuff a lot. He would make a running gag out of things, you know, so that it would repeat, but it would be part of the joke. Also, there's another thing that uh, Dick excelled at was uh, effects animation. You know, the, the, the feeling of, of a super breeze blowing through the, uh, through the camera shot. Oh, that's nice. Wow. I just love this one. This is just about all of Dick Humor's stuff. It's a it's a kosher for Passover sky. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, God, look at the way his eyes blow off of his head and the thick and thin line on that. That's a really great idea. <laughs> and then he fools the audience by having a face on the other side of his head. Yeah, that kid really is the ancestor of Scrappy. Just the attitudes uh, of, of him and, you know, the, his... Is kind of the way he frowns a lot. Now there is is a. Um, I don't know why he had a, a Chinese uh, looking face there. He might have been referring to a Chinese restaurant. And then of course the pawn shop, you know, with the with the three balls on it. And now the the little baby is counting out that piece of cloth. Oh, it's a it's actually a lightning bolt. I see. Yeah, the lightning bolt collapsed to the ground, and the kid counted it out. Good cycle. <laughs> I don't know why all of a sudden three two beer gets in there, but uh, it was at, that was a prohibition gag, you know. Love the feeling of wind there. The kid's a rain stopper. Look at that stuff. Wow. And Dick's getting a lot of mileage out of that cycle. <laughs> Max really put up with a lot. Barber pole gag, cyclone. And the little baby comes back into the shot. Wow, he blew all of Max's shirt off. I think there there was probably a little chunk of action missing there with, with Max's shirt getting blown off, but it's it's essentially pretty much complete. That, that's such a good cartoon. Yeah, I think that's to, to be, that's one of my top five all time favorite Cocos. That's the, the, the storm. I just love that one. I think Mauricio's got enough uh, cocos to last all night. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think Dick worked on this one too. 
Coco Showtime. But that's, I don't think that's the original title of it. Can't remember what it's called right now. I just think it's just called The Show. That's a really good indication of the way they handled Coco as far as leaving gaps in his costume to allow for to show wrinkles. And then they just inked around those wrinkles. They just left them blank so that there was a uh, texture in his costume. <laughs> I think here again, some of the dialogue titles are missing. Makes you wonder how they um, how they actually derived the stories for Coco. You know, whether um, Max and Dave worked it out all themselves in these early ones, or they had a story crew at this point. I don't really know. It looked like they had to pretty much carefully figure out, at least in the combination shots, what Coco was going to do and what Max was going to do so that they could uh, you know, finish it up later and do everything correctly. But who knows? Maybe there was some improvisation going on there. Check your guns here. I'm sorry, but we can't show this cartoon anymore. There's no fat shaming allowed. <laughs> he just wants to make sure that she's comfortable. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we're, we're starting to get into the into the dick humor section. Yeah, yeah, this looks like his stuff to me. Yeah, this really looks like his. Crowd scenes is tough stuff to do. Wow, Will Rogers. I guess the Fleischers would have been familiar with Will because he performed in the Ziegfeld Follies. You know, going all the way back to, what, 1915, 1916. Gallagher and Sheen. Uh, Mr. Gallagher. Yes, Mr. Gallagher. Yeah, they had a whole vaudeville routine going on. It looks like probably some of that is missing. The Jazzy Loons. It's hard to tell what kind of a soundtrack the Fleischers had in mind for this. They might have had a special score written to be performed live in the theater. It's hard to tell. The, is that Theodora Duncan? Or is that, no, that's Isadora Duncan, sorry. <laughs> that, that has a dick, dick humor kind of uh, layout to it. Yeah, this really looks like his. This looks like one of Dick's scenes there, too. Professor Blotz. Concert pianist. Love the way that piano looks, the way it, it bows to the audience. Equestrian beautiful. Yeah, this looks this looks like one of Dick's uh, cycles. The inking looks like his. Train seals.
gobbles gobbles the ball right down. <laughs> Clever ending. That has a vaudeville. Noodles the clown is. I I used to think that for some reason they thought that that Coco's name was Noodles at one point, but I don't know if that's really accurate or not. They might have just done it just for the purposes of this one cartoon. He's playing a character on stage, a magician named Noodles. That's all Dick's animation there too, by the way. Yeah, that's all his. Here's the magic. He's going <laughs> to drink all the water in the goldfish bowl. That's nice personality stuff on. I love the way the eyes take on all kinds of different shapes. You'll see that in the early Scrappy cartoons too. Like Scrappy has dots for eyes and then they change. God, look, that's a wild sequence. Oh my gosh. Ah. Ah. We have every ethnic caricature of the book here, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Gonna drink. Ooh, good grief, Max! You're killing yourself. Wow. Then it's like super white out. He's gonna eat everything on the set. Oh, that's wonderful. Have we ever found a, a little bit better condition copy of that one, uh, Mauricio? We're looking because it, it, you know, because some of that live action stuff, that transformation stuff is really effective. You know, the way it cha changes into a, a black person and then then a, a, a Jewish guy and, and all these different uh, different uh, people. Max just becomes these different people. And somehow the way they cut it, it's it's credible. It really looks like he's transforming into these people. I don't, I'm not quite sure how they brought that across, but it, it's, it's, it looks like the, the, the film editing was very carefully done. So um, it'd, be, it'd be great to find um, a really good condition print of that that would you know, show, maybe there's probably a few transitions missing there, but that's a wonderful one, the, the show. I really like that one a lot. Yeah, here's hoping we can find good copies. I think a lot of these are, um, or just spread out we just have to look but but yeah uh, hopefully we can find more of them uh we just they're all over the world i know it's just the, the hard thing is like you mentioned they might be titled something different so that's the difficult thing who knows what they would call them in different countries you know if they would call them yeah. Coco or something else but i'll play you an, one more and uh we'll call it a night i think you'll really enjoy okay. this one that's fine with me. Then I got to do my chores. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. I, I had a print of this that I, I put together the hard way from about three or four different prints, all home movie prints. And I, ju I just tried to reconstruct the whole cartoon. It took me a long time to finish that one. It's got all these little paper squares that look like they've been derived from a... You, they used to have these uh, transfers, you know, where you'd rub them down like decals. Yeah, they're decals. You'd rub them down and, and it would... Uh, a little portion of your picture would transfer to another page. Yeah, Max is, is licking the, 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 the decals as they go down. Now, I'm not sure if, uh, if this is one that Dick worked on or not, but it's got some really interesting ideas in it. There's again, he's rubbing off some more transfers, some more decals. And this is just an endless parade of um, fairy tale characters. Like this is, is just an old, an old witch, of course. You did a nice job of transferring this so you can kind of see the uh, the top portion and the bottom portion of the picture a little bit better. 
And there's little boy blue, of course. <laughs> this even has uh, some of the uh, the uh, dialogue titles, which is nice. Yeah, that has kind of a dick humor feel to it. Just that little scene right there. It looks like one of his. Yeah, see, again, there's that scrappy uh, fight timing they just had in the storm. Yeah, that, that has a that has a dick humor feel to it. Beautiful inking on that too. Yeah, there's a nice nice little pantomime little pantomime bits and acting bits in these that Dick knew how to draw. <laughs> <laughs> three uh, rub a dub dub three men in a tub yep he comes at three dubs in a tub yeah, that has a feeling of a dick humor thing it, it looks like his effects too he was pretty adept at doing effects animation in, in the in the pen and ink era See, he wasn't afraid to have flexible spines in his characters. You know, the, the way they would lean into things, the way they would lean backwards. That, that, well, that really has a scrappy look to it. But the way the little kids are going to slide down the hill, Jack and Jill. Yeah, look at that. The design of the movement as Jack and Jill tumbled over each other was very nice, too. It had this kind of spiky look to it the, the interesting uh, approach to the design of the of the movement you know a ton of little kids very much in the scrappy vein and, and the, the little ethnic caricature runs out of the shoe that has a nice feeling of transition and it looks like crazy cat doesn't it the cat and the fiddle it has a lot of that has a lot of strong crazy cat feel to it. Now I don't think that these are not uh, Dick scenes. This is somebody else that did these. Maybe Doc Crandall. The dish ran away with the sp spoon. The little dog laughed to see such sport, and the cow jumped over the moon, and all that fun stuff. Simple Simon, yeah, the pimpled Simon. Yeah, I'm not sure who did this scene. Again, it's 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 a lot more limited and more primitive looking than it's interesting. You can see this primitive style stuff right alongside Dick Humors, which was had so much character to it and so much drawing in it. This animator likes to uh, change the staging a lot he likes to, to uh, have the characters you know rotating around each other and changing position in the layout simple simon met a pieman yeah i think this is probably i'm not quite sure if that sticks or not but it looks like it's getting back to his way of thinking the four and twenty four and million blackbirds baked in a pie. And he's gonna put Humpty Dumpty up there. I think this is a pretty special looking shot from what I recall. I haven't seen this one in a while. And it's Max in this big surprise ending. 
I'm gonna roll him right up in the page and stuff him <laughs> in the inkwell. That'll turn your head around. Small Max goes in the inkwell, and then the full size Max's hand puts Coco back in the inkwell. Yeah, that's just that just shows that's you a, how much of a genius he was. Oh yeah, that's a real multi uh, multi level thinking there. Again, I don't know how they worked out the stories on these, but somehow they managed it. You can kind of see what is the printed because when, when they did the live action animation, they actually made full size photo duplicates, uh, you know, the same size as the artwork because they didn't do opticals very much in those days. They just made printouts of the individual frames and then photographed the animation together with that blown up frame. That's also how Walter Lance did a lot of his dinky doodle stuff. Uh, he did it the same way. He didn't, he didn't use opticals. The optical printing was very primitive in those days. If it existed much at all, they had to do things other ways. But there's a lot of terrific little special effects stuff going on in this cartoon. And I love the effect of decals. I think that's a, that's a great idea. I have all these little uh, mother goose decals coming to life. Probably uh, that way they based that on an actual children's collectible in those days, you know, that little kids could get these decals for next to nothing, probably from a loaf of bread or from their local grocery store and then have a whole collection of pictures. Long before the internet, you know, kids had to get their little pictorial materials, however they could. And uh, there was a lot of goodwill uh, put out by stores who printed these pictures. And then they gave them away to kids. Like when I was a kid, they gave us um, at the Buster Brown shoe store in Webster Groves, Missouri, they gave us Buster Brown comic books. And they were so beautiful, all in full color and the adventures of Buster Brown and Tig and, and all the characters from the Buster Brown uh, television show were in those comic books. And we got them for free. Of course, we'd had to pretend we were buying shoes, you know. <laughs> We would go in and look at shoes like like we actually were seriously intended to buy a pair. And then the, the clerk would, would like us so much just for looking at the shoes, he'd give us a free comic book. So that's what, what the kids used to amuse themselves with before iPhones. <laughs> Did Buster Brown ever have a, a series of his own? Of cartoons? Yeah. Well, on television he did. Yeah, Buster was on both radio and TV. He started in radio with a guy named Smiling Ed McConnell. And then uh, they had the Buster Brown show on Saturday mornings. That was some of the very earliest Saturday morning TV. That goes back to the early 50s. And uh, then when Smiling Ed passed on, they got Andy Devine to take his place. And it was called Andy's Gang for years and years. And they had Froggy the Gremlin, Midnight the Cat. Uh, oh, so many little characters that went along with Buster and Ty. I just loved that show. And they had a live action serial chapters. They had Gunga Ram from India. Uh, he had his own serialized adventures. And I think they had a Western character. They did a lot of serials. So yeah, that was a show that actually had no animation to speak of. It was mostly puppets. Puppets and live actors. Uh, uh, actually, uh, they used a midget <laughs> dressed up like Buster Brown. And he hid inside the shoe with, with his dog, Tig, who is a real dog. What did he say? I'm Buster Brown. I live in a shoe. Here's my dog, Tig. He lives in there, too. I guess you've never seen those shows, have you, Mauricio? I remember the store. I think in the 90s, uh, there was still a Buster Brown store. Um, what part of town? Local, uh, over here on Stonewood. On Stonewood, uh, there was a, there was a Buster Brown store. Yeah, Did they give away free comic books? I wish. I just remember <laughs> that logo, the, the little boy with his, his funny little hat and the uh, and the little bulldog or. Oh yeah. This little dog. Yeah, I remember. I, I wonder if they're still around. But yeah, I totally remember that store. Well, you, you, are you familiar with the Buster comic strip that goes all the way back to I think eighteen ninety six? In the no, New York Herald and New York Journal? The only thing I've seen from 
That's, I found interesting, interesting is the Mel Brinkrat. He has a collection of, of Buster Brown, you know, stuff, whether it's like... Oh, I'm sure he... Yeah, he's, doesn't he have a great collection of Mickey Mouse stuff, too, and, and oh, a yeah. lot of early uh, uh, comic characters? Um, I Mel think Brinkrat. He's, he's featured in the Mickey Mouse documentary. Oh, so yeah, they, that's right. They go to his house and they film all this stuff. Yeah, he has a fantastic collector of all that stuff and wonderful toys and all kinds of he, I like the way he's displayed everything too put them up all over his house there's a really very creative the way he's done all that he's a very interesting character but uh, yeah it's it's interesting that he uh, he collects on on Buster Brown but I love the uh, 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 James I think it was James Felton Outcult who created the character and uh, then, too, like the Cats and Jammer kids, two newspapers fought over, <laughs> fought over the character. Like they fought over Buster, like the way they fought over the Cats and Jammer kids. For a while, uh, two different cartoonists were creating two different strips with the same characters in two different papers. That was quite a situation. That doesn't happen anymore. Now, it, did this come from the 16 millimeter print? Yes. The, the tinted print? Mm hmm. Very good. But I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. I'll save some okay. more for next time. I don't want to keep you up all night, but th it was really fun seeing those, Mauricio. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, and I'll have plenty more to show you soon. I think we're, we're going to have some finished inkwell imps, and those are always fun to look at. Um, especially, you know, from the negative. I mean, it looks so clear. It's just wonderful to check out. So, How oh, wonderful. Well, those would be great to see. And I love seeing Accordion Joe. That was really fun to see again. I love that. Hey. I love the song in it. I think Cliff Edwards, uh, you know, U uh, Ukulele Ike or Jiminy Cricket, as he's known it, I think he also made a recording of that song. Yeah, the, the, yeah this, one, this one, the Jumping Bees, is a masterpiece of inking. Just terrific line work in it. Hopefully we can get access to the 35 that's in an archive. So fingers crossed. We'll get I, I know one person that has one. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> well, thankfully, there's another copy elsewhere. But so. we, won't, we won't go into that. <laughs> but, uh, but thank you again, Mark. I appreciate your time, and uh, we'll save some more for you for next time. Okay, terrific. See you later, then. Okay, later, Mark. Night.